Galur Cynulliad Cynulliad I call the National Assembly to order, and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister. And the first question is from Neil Hamilton. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on what the Welsh Government is doing to support leisure centres across Mid and West Wales? Yes, local authorities are responsible for public leisure centres. They provide funding uh, for leisure centres through the revenue settlement, uh, and of course it is for them uh, to decide the pattern of services across their county area. I thank the uh, First Minister for his reply. Um, he's a well-informed chap, and I'm sure he knows that there's a public meeting tonight in Knighton uh, to consider the proposal to, by Powys County Council to close the leisure centre in Knighton. Um, this will be uh, very bad news for the town, of course. Mary Strong, the head teacher at the primary school, says the school uses it every single day. It keeps the community together, which is important as communities like Knighton have lost so much over the years, and also it's very difficult to travel by public transport in this part of the country, so having this on the doorstep, of course, is a vital local resource. Will he encourage Powys County Council to keep uh, the Knighton Leisure Centre open? Indeed, I would. I mean, they've had a better uh, settlement than they would have expected, uh, even if they were not able to uh, continue uh, funding the Leisure Centre. There are examples across Wales where the local community has managed to take the Leisure Centre over. Uh, but nevertheless, given the fact that their financial situation is, is, not, is better than they would have expected, uh, then I would uh, encourage them to uh, uh, examine every way of providing a service to the local community. Angela Burns. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, of course, First Minister, leisure centres play an important role in rehabilitation. Uh, people who've had uh, heart attacks, strokes, suffer from diabetes, uh, have COPD. Um, are people who very often will go to a leisure centre after they've done their six mandatory weeks of physiotherapy. How do you square that public health uh, need with the fact that so many leisure centres are under threat by local authorities at the moment? And what do you think that your government could do to ensure that local authorities realise that this is a very important part of somebody getting better and leading a more secure, happy and uh, integrated life going forward? Well, indeed, we know that uh, social pres prescriptions are hugely important, that uh, pharmaceutical intervention is not the be-all and end-all for uh, people. And that's why it's important that a network of leisure centres is maintained across the whole of Wales. And whilst leisure is not a statutory duty for local authorities, leisure is nevertheless a hugely important uh, issue both locally uh, and important in order to enable people to continue to live uh, healthy lives. Joyce Watson. Sure. Uh, Clarewith. Uh, First Minister, do, do you agree with me that uh, we often see uh, very many claims uh, and that are uh, disputed afterwards by highly paid consultants about the transference of, of providing a service? And I'm talking particularly here about um, the Unison report against the transfer of the service, uh, the leisure facility services in Pembrokeshire, which is, uh, in their words, um, not in the best interest of the people who would want to access those services, and neither would it be in necessarily in the best interest of those people who currently work within those services. So could I ask you, First Minister, to seek some assurances from Pembrokeshire County Council when they're trying to negotiate their way through transferring, what, in my opinion, what shouldn't be transferred in the first place? Well, it's a matter ultimately for the Council, of course, but uh, from uh, the, the perspective of the Welsh Government, we would never want to see a situation occur uh, where staff find that they have inferior terms and conditions as a result of changes to the way a service is delivered. Our preference would be uh, for services to be delivered in-house. Simon Thomas. Uh, with, uh Thank you, Chloe. It's difficult to see how we can achieve the objectives of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act if young people and people more generally in our communities can't access leisure centres and specifically swimming pools and swimming is part of the national curriculum, of course. And as has just been mentioned, the school council at Knighton School have written to me and many other members expressing their disappointment in the border town, which is a long distance from other towns that they should be losing such an important resource. I welcome the fact that you have said that this resource should be kept open. They have had a better financial settlement, partly because of the agreement between Plaid Cymru and the Labour government. So what can you as a government do to provide specific advice to Powys Council on the possibility of moving this resource into the community's hands? Because it's clear that the community do treasure the resource and they want to keep it open. 
Well, we make it clear that it's for the council to consider in detail the possibility of retaining and keeping the leisure centre open. But if not, they should consider ensuring that there's an opportunity for the community to run the centre itself. There are examples of that across Wales. But what nobody would want to see is seeing the centre being closed without those options being explored. My question die, Wadi. Question two is withdrawn. Question three, Hannah Blythin. Will the First Minister provide an update on the Welsh Government's strategy to strengthen links between Wales and the USA? Well, the current political landscape around the world means relations with the US are more important than ever, economically, politically and culturally. We do maintain a strong presence in the US, including opening our latest office in Atlanta. And I visited the USA in September and plan to visit again next year. Thank, thank you. Thanks, FM. Um, the Wales, Wales has many historic links with the USA. A number of the signatories on the Declaration of Independence were Welsh, and I'm sure you'll agree that there is much to be made of these historic links to promote trade and tourism, for the former or the more important in the light of Brexit. Indeed, today is potentially a historic day in the USA. As citizens go to the polls in the election, I, I would just have played a tiny part in, in Philadelphia, in which you could see for the first time a woman make it to the White House as president. Who wins the White House has an impact beyond the boundaries of the USA. With that in mind, I'm sure many here will join me in hoping America chooses Hillary Clinton over the alternative and to see hope Trump hates. Uh, does, the effort, does the First Minister believe that in 2016 it's time that we saw a woman president of the USA? Yeah. Uh, these are matters for the US population, of course, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I can see the strong point that, that she makes. Uh, for me, uh, what is hugely important is that the relationship with the USA continues, that the USA doesn't become an isolationist, nationalist country, uh, and nothing happens after the election that imperils the commitment of the USA to NATO. I think these are all issues that, uh, that concern us, and I can, I can certainly uh, well understand the strong feeling uh, that uh, with a glass ceiling having been broken last time in 2008, that another one uh, needs to be broken this time. Yeah. Paul Davis. Thank you, Chloe. The First Minister, I'm sure you'd agree with me that Pembrokeshire produces a great deal of excellent produce which places Pembrokeshire and indeed Wales on the map and it's crucial that the government should do everything in its ability to promote our produce, produce in nations such as the United States. Now, I understand that the Welsh Government is reviewing its export support for food and drink companies, but can you tell us what additional support the Welsh Government can provide to small producers who are looking to export their produce to nations such as the United States? Well, there is advice and support available through the team here in Cardiff, but also advice from the offices in America. There will be a group travelling to America later this month, a trade mission, to see what kind of interest there is from investors into Wales, but also to seek new markets for producers. Uh, the outgoing president uh, suggested that the UK might find ourselves at the back of the queue if we voted for Brexit. Uh, given what has happened with the referendum results, the election of a, a new president today, but also the stalling of the uh, TTIP negotiations and the formidable challenges they face. Is it actually possible that Wales within the United Kingdom may actually uh, see us take the European Union's place and go to the front of that queue? <laughs> I, I, I doubt it. His party has been very strongly against TTIP for reasons that, that are not European. Uh, now, if TTIP uh, would be an, is an agreement that will be presented uh, for the UK, then his objections would still remain. Uh, I've heard objections from uh, many who have uh, called into question the ability of governments to provide public services with TTIP as it currently stands, so I assume that he would be as uh, vehement in his objections to TTIP if it would be a UK-US agreement uh, as he would have been if it had been an EU-US agreement. Question in our Questions now from the party leaders, the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davis. Presiding officer, uh, as a party that broke the glass ceiling some nearly 40 years ago now, First Minister, uh, I'll gladly hand the Labour Party the manual on how to uh, elect a female to be leader, uh, should you care to read that manual. Uh, but I want to ask you a serious question on business rates, if possible, please, First Minister. 
Um, with the recent revaluation of businesses, the length and breadth of Wales, many businesses face horrendous increases in their business rates. Uh, what is your view on the revaluation that has taken place and the position that many small and medium-sized businesses find themselves in? Three things. I would expect most businesses to see a reduction in their rateable value, if only for the fact that the last uh, valuation took place in 2008, before, of course, the uh, world economic crisis that occurred uh, after that. Uh, secondly, however, of course, our small business rate relief scheme will continue to reach more businesses, a great percentage of businesses, than is the case in, in England. And thirdly, we are putting in place a transitional relief scheme, £10 million of new money, uh, which will help those businesses who are uh, looking at uh, substantial rises in their rates uh, following the valuation. One thing I should add, of course, businesses, if they feel that they have been overvalued, uh, should contact the Valuation Office Agency as quickly as possible in order to raise their concerns. Uh, thank you for that answer, First Minister. The Leader of the House and myself uh, attended a protest in Cowbridge, but I've been to many towns over the last fortnight, and it seems to be an example uh, coming time and time again of certainly secondary retail uh, properties uh, and also uh, hospitality areas uh, seem to have done pretty poorly under this revaluation, and many are facing a huge increase in their rateable values, well over 100% in many instances. Uh, I hear what you say about the measures that the Welsh Government have put on the table and they are welcome uh, but it does seem as if certainly in the transition should the consultation be taken forward by the minister to the new regime in April 2018 unless more is done in this current budget round to offer more assistance to some of those businesses who find themselves on the wrong end of these valuations uh, they just aren't going to be around in April 2018 can you offer any comfort to the businesses that do find themselves bearing these huge increases in their rateable values that the, the budget process will look at trying to release additional funding to enable a softer landing uh, for many of these businesses in the new era of business rates? Well, again, uh, I make mention of the fact that £10 million is being set aside in new money uh, for a transitional scheme to help businesses who do face these difficulties. I regret that you weren't able to offer some more comfort than that because certainly the businesses I have spoken to when they've looked at the 10 million transitional money that is available do not believe that that will go far enough to help them to stay in business and I don't underestimate the offer that the Welsh Government has made but there are some very very genuine concerns out there that with the new regime that is in place um, on, on the valuation from 27, April 2017 businesses just will not be able to continue and so I do think it's regret you haven't been able to offer some comfort that the, with the budget round continuing at the moment, uh, you cannot look at the budget lines and maybe try and find additional resources to help some of these businesses in the transition. But you also touched on the valuation office and the appeal structure, which is well understood by many of these businesses. I've been told that many businesses have a horrendous time accessing the valuation office uh, and in particular just been able to get the process underway so they can challenge some of these valuations. Will you work with the Valuation Office to make sure that when businesses do contact them, they do get a timely response? Because I do fear for the financial well-being of many of these small businesses that have approached myself and many other members from across the parties in this chamber, and they will not be with us after April the 1st unless they get some assistance. Uh, well, can I, I don't want to uh, undervalue their position in any way. Could I uh, ask the Leader of the Welsh Conservatives to write to me with those examples? Uh, he's made mention of uh, one particular town. Uh, he's made, made mention of businesses that have experienced difficulty uh, through the appeals process uh, and have seen a potentially uh, large increase in their business rates. If you could share those examples with me, I will, of course, uh, look at them in order to inform uh, our position uh, in terms of the next year or two. Leader of the UKIP Group, Neil Hamilton. Uh, the government a few days ago announced that there would be a cut to the budget for climate change projects of 36% as uh, UKIP stood in the last election on a policy of cutting this budget. I'm glad to see that the First Minister is coming our way just as on uh, managed migration. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's rather quixotic that, uh, that the big cuts are coming in flood defences which um, are necessary quite regardless of the theories on man-made global warming. But will the First Minister uh, accept that even the IPCC believes that there's been no global warming since 1998 and that there was only a 0.4% rise in global temperatures between 1975 and 1998, which is similar to the period between 1860 and 1880 and again between 1910 and 1940. So is it not good sense, therefore, 
not to be spending huge sums of money on uh, the consequences of a theory which are merely conjectural. Well, firstly, uh, I, 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 I like to look at the weight of evidence when we deal with a particular scenario, and the overwhelming weight of evidence uh, from those who are qualified is that climate change is happening and that human activity has an effect on climate change. Now, if, it's, if climate change isn't happening, then there, clearly we need to re-examine our flood defence policy because we're spending money on flood defences that apparently aren't needed because, of course, we are putting in place flood defences to deal with flooding uh, events that have occurred in some parts of Wales where they've not been experienced uh, before, and the, uh, the residents of uh, uh, Talabond in Ceredigion uh, will uh, provide evidence for that. Uh, we're also looking to provide defences for people based on what is what the experts tell us uh, will be an increase in global temperatures and a uh, subsequent uh, disturbance of weather patterns over the next few years. I mean, climate change is something that doesn't happen over five or ten years. It happens over many, many decades. Uh, and it, it is measured not necessarily in the span of a human lifetime, a lifetime either. Well, the first ones will know that I believe these are mere oscillations. But I'm interested in, in, in and all the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the historical evidence proves that. But, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in the effect upon the life and livelihoods of, of our electors of government policy. Uh, he will know that 23% of households in Wales are in fuel poverty on the government's own definition. That's 291 thousand households, um, and the 20% of the average fuel bill in a house now is accounted for by green taxes on an average household bill of £1,500 a year, that's £300 a year. For somebody on a very low income, that uh, is a very significant uh, uh, diminution in their real standard of living. Is there not something that the government can do to benefit the lives of ordinary people by opposing these green taxes and uh, restoring some semblance of sanity in our policy on climate change. If it's a question of sanity, then the insanity he displayed along with his party in the 1980s when uh, our coal mining industry was, uh, was closed down uh, is, is testament to that. I may mean, I welcome his conversion, but one thing I have to say to him is that coal as a source of fuel is not going to return in the UK. The deep mines are gone, they've been built over, uh, there are buildings and homes over them. The only option is open casting, if he wishes to advocate that, he is welcome to join me and the residents of Kenfrick Hill in my constituency who have particular views on open casting uh, and uh, having to live next door to a, what is at the moment a, a dormant and derelict open cast site. The reality is that we have a choice as a nation, either uh, we seek to import more energy, be that natural gas from, for example, Russia, uh, or we seek to import even more liquid natural gas. We seek to uh, import coal from uh, other countries in the world. Uh, that is one choice. Or we go for energy security. And we develop uh, an energy system uh, that uh, draws on renewable energy, but is also secure for us in the future. That, I think, is the perfectly sensible option. Well, the First Minister will know that the percentage of electricity generated by wind power or solar energy is minute, typically between 3 and 5 per cent. So the idea that energy security can be obtained by more and more windmills uh, is nonsense and would result in the utter desecration of our countryside as well. But I'm interested in the impact of green taxes upon poor people. His party came into existence in order to fight for the interests of working people, but it's his party more than all because of the Climate Change Act which his government introduced in 2008, and it, it, in, in the government's own assessment of its costs would be 18 billion a year, 720 billion pounds over 40 years. The, this is a crown of thorns that's being put down on the heads of ordinary people. I cannot stand here in all seriousness and listen to a man with his history lecture me about standing up for working people. Yeah. This is somebody who sat there in Parliament in the 1980s and waved through the greatest act of industrial vandalism that the UK has ever seen. The destruction of jobs in the steel industry, the erosion of the coal industry, communities having their livelihoods destroyed by a government that did not care. The enemy within, the enemy within is what the party opposite called the very working people of South Wales and the United Kingdom. We stand up for working people, we stand up for energy sources that are safe, and we will continue to make sure, first of all, that people don't forget 
what the, the parties opposite did to them in the 1980s, and we will continue to ensure that people have jobs, they have secure energy and fairness, replacing what the parties opposite took away from them. And on behalf of Plaid Cymru, Rhyna Pialwer. Thank you, Llywydd. Is the First Minister aware of the scale of the problem of former members of the armed forces suffering mental health problems? And does he accept what the predecessor Health Committee said in describing support for veterans in Wales as being inadequate and inappropriate? No, I don't accept that. And of course, every year we have put forward a new package of support for veterans. And that's exactly what we'll be doing in this year, too, to ensure, of course, that they do have means of access to mental health care and for them to receive support with everything that they need once they leave the armed forces. We don't know exactly how many veterans are suffering with mental health problems because those exact figures aren't published, but we do think that some 4% do suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. We believe that some one in five suffers some sort of mental health problem. This is a minority of veterans, of course, but as we approach Remembrance Sunday, then every veteran should understand that those who served alongside them are appreciated and that they are seen for what they are, namely assets for our communities and for the workplace and so on. Now, given what the Health Committee said in the last Assembly and what the BMA said in describing support as being inconsistent, what steps is the government intending to take now to ensure that public services do treat Welsh veterans who need support in the way in which they fully deserve? Well, in my opinion, this happens now. But having said that, there's no one system that can't be improved and the way to do that is the way that we're doing now is those using those bodies who support veterans so that we can strengthen packages put forward for them and now we have a good relationship with those between those bodies and government much we do of course and remembrance week is a good uh, time to remind ourselves that we owe a duty of care to former service personnel and i have no doubt of course that the first minister would agree with me on that but the budget uh, for the all wales veterans health and well-being service is just 585 thousand pounds that's less than one hundredth of one percent of the overall health budget. Now, Plaid Cymru believes that a Military Wellbeing Act is needed to ensure that support for veterans is consistent and of a high quality across the country, so all veterans know that public services will have a legal obligation uh, to be there for their former comrades. So if, uh, as most would agree, what Welsh Government is currently doing for veterans isn't enough, will the First Minister pledge to legislate during this Assembly to ensure that when it comes to housing or medical care, no veteran is left behind? The effect of legislation would be, but nevertheless the sentiments that the uh, member expresses are ones which I share that we want to ensure uh, that our veterans get the best package possible and the best deal possible once they have left the, uh, the armed forces. Uh, that is done through working with veterans organisations such as the Royal British Legion. It's done through ensuring there is sufficient funding available specifically to help veterans over and above uh, funding for the general population in areas such as uh, health. And we'll continue to examine uh, what the most effective ways are of improving that service in the future. Question Pedwar. Question four, Lord Griffith. Thank you. So, with will the First Minister make a statement on homeschool children in Wales? Well, in Cynabod. Well, we recognise the rights of parents to home educate their children, and we also recognise the rights of children to receive an efficient and suitable education, to be listened to, and to be safe. And our revised guidance, to be published shortly, reflect this. Uh, Thank you for that response. I'm sure you'll be aware that the Children's Commission has called on the government to introduce statutory guidance to make it a requirement for, child, for parents to register the fact that they are homeschooling their children. 
and it's been made clear recently in the Children, Young People and Education Committee that she would be willing to use her statutory powers in order to encourage the government to move in that direction. Would you therefore agree with the Commissioner and myself and many others that every day of delay runs the risk that another individual, and unfortunately we do have to say another individual, is let down by this government because they run the risk of disappearing under the radar? Well, lo local authorities, of course, have the main responsibility here, but I'm not saying that, that we don't have any responsibility at all to ensure we'll ensure that the guidance that come out that will strengthen the situation of local authorities and will explain what the duties and rights of parents, children, and of course, local authorities are. And we'll continue to consider how efficient those and effective those that guidance will be. Uh, and we want to ensure that they are effective. And if anything needs to be changed in the system, we will do so. But at, pre I'm, at present, I'm confident that those guidance will go much further to ensure the safety of children. Yeah. Well, first, Mr. It's interesting and pleasing to hear that the statutory guide or the guidance will be issued very shortly because in my own authority, there's a known 114 children who are being home educated, but there's only one part-time officer working with those. Can you also ensure that the guidance is going to enforce or put more pressure on local authorities to have a sort of a relationship between children, the number of children they see and the officer, so that 114 for one is not adequate. We need to ensure more officers are actually working with those home educated children so they get the best support possible. Well, clearly it's important that local authorities have enough people to, uh, to work with uh, home educating, educating parents and home educated children. We will consider carefully if there are any further steps that will need to be uh, taken. Regulation might be appropriate in the future, if necessary, in order to uh, support home educated uh, learners. Uh, but our approach is to use this guidance to make sure that local authorities are able to uh, get the clarity that they need to act uh, swiftly uh, where they feel that they uh, that they have to. We will, of course, continue to work with the professionals uh, in order for them to be able to work effectively with those uh, families who do home etiquette. Susie Davis. Uh, Deal, Llywydd. Um, some families freely choose homeschooling, while others feel they have no alternative uh, because the alternatives to school education for a troubled child are limited. Uh, while the number of the latter has dropped, the number of the former has increased from uh, over a thousand five years ago to over 1500 last year. What does that say about the confidence of families who choose to, uh, about the, the confidence in our school education system that they choose to homeschool? And for those families that, that enrol but then withdraw their child, how sure are you that budget cuts, um, as, in, as has happened in Swansea, haven't reduced the, um, the, the child's entitlement to an appropriate level of education? No, there, there are many different reasons why uh, parents choose to uh, home educate. I don't believe that. Uh, the system as a whole is a reason for that. We are seeing ever improving education results in Wales. And of course, we're seeing uh, budgets having been protected and investment in schools, unlike, of course, the situation across the border. Michelle Brown. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, how does the Welsh Government ensure that homeschool children will receive a, a good standard of education? Well, these, uh, the, the guidance, of course, will help to continue to ensure that, providing local authorities with the clarity that they need uh, to ensure that the, uh, the education that is provided uh, is of a sufficient standard. Question Pimp, Mike. Question five, Mike Hedges. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on no cold calling zones in Wales? We know that no cold calling zones help to make people feel safer in their communities. We know the number of homes covered by zones continues to increase. What we are never sure of is whether cold calling zones include political canvases. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, no cold calling zones are popular with residents. Uh, when delivering leaflets during half term in areas with no cold calling zones, I noticed a large number of houses with no uninvited trader stickers on their doors. What can the Welsh Government do to support councils in expanding the areas covered by no cold calling zones? Well, in, in March 2013, a baseline review established 38,000 homes were covered by the zones. In November of 2013, we invited local authorities to bid for funding to support the creation of zones in their areas. After only 12 authorities requested funding and just under £35,000 was uh, provided. That said, the number of homes covered by uh, zones has now increased to 53,000. Russell George. Yeah. Uh, First Minister, I certainly uh, believe that more needs to be done to protect consumers against unsolicited uh, mail uh, and nuisance calls. According to the Office of Fair Trading, these types of scams are estimated to cost the victims uh, around three and a half billion pounds a year. 
Uh, can I ask, is the, has the government considered a imposing a levy on the sender of mail, uh, similar to that of the carrier bag charge, of course allowing that money to be reinvested in different areas such as the forestry industry, protecting rural post offices or helping local authorities to uh, recycle waste? I think the difficulty with that is that most of the mail does not originate in Wales. The carrier bags, it's easy enough, the carrier bags are in the shop in Wales to begin with. Uh, it's an issue that, that it, if we expand it more widely, uh, applies to waste. Most of the waste that comes into Wales uh, and is generated as waste isn't actually from Wales to begin with. For me, the answer lies in a UK and I say European uh, approach to this because uh, we know that certainly within the UK, unsolicited mail is still a problem. It's not as it was because, of course, email is much easier now. And as I'm sure we all know in this chamber, the scourge of uh, telephone calls by uh, organisations who are outside the telephone preference service. I would be very supportive of any legislation at UK level that would strengthen uh, the rights of, in, of uh, people to avoid these calls in the future with suitable penalties uh, if needs be. Question, Question 6, Dialoid. Thank you, Llywydd. Will the First Minister make a statement on historical Welsh place names? Well, our historic place names provide invaluable evidence about the development of our nation. And the, it's one of the requirements of the Historic Environment Wales Act 2016 that the Welsh ministers should create a list of historic place names that will then record this rich heritage for the future. Thank you very much for that response, First Minister. Now, as you've noted, it's been said over the past few years that there are a number of examples of historic place names on old houses, halls and farms that the historic Welsh names have all come under threat and very often some are changed to English names. Now, do you as a government agree that there is potential to develop legislation where Local, uh, local planning authorities' permission will be required before changing historic Welsh place names? Well, that's something that we have considered, uh, but when we looked at it, there are more names changed from English to Welsh than from Welsh to English. And as a result, in what way would it be possible to police this through the planning scheme or regime? I'm not in favour of changing Welsh names to English names, place names, that is. But having said that, the Welsh Language Commissioner has established a panel to provide her with advice and recommendations about the way in which we can ensure that our heritage in the Welsh language is safeguarded. First Minister, it is important that historic Welsh place names are safeguarded so that people understand their local history better and it helps to keep that history alive. Now, in order to help in safeguarding historic place names, in addition to publishing a list, what guidance has your government published to date? Well, Paul Davis is talking about what I mentioned earlier, which is the work of the commissioner, and that's something I welcome as someone who lived, lives in a, in a town where there are huge problems with some streets because of the fact that the names of the streets have been Welsh for decades, and then they've been translated very poorly into English, and nobody now knows where they live. And there are several examples in Bridgend where the Welsh names for roads have been misspelled or been misinterpreted and, and mistranslated to. So nobody knows where they are now. So it is important because people can't receive credit as a result of that. And the sat -navs don't work either. But it shows how important this issue is to ensure that we have one name in the Welsh language that is considered as the official name, where that name has been an historic name over decades and centuries. Question 7, David Ellis Thomas. Thank you, Llywydd. When did the First Minister meet with the Secretary of State for Wales to discuss the Wales Bill? I have discussed the Wales Bill with the Secretary of State on a number of occasions. The last time over the phone, last Friday, and it's very important that the UK government does respond positively to the reports that have been published recently. Were you any the wiser, First Minister, following your discussions because myself and the other member of the House of Lords sitting opposite have been in three sittings already discussing the Wales Bill and have received some positive responses from the Minister Lord Bourne from Aberystwyth, of Aberystwyth rather, but it's clear to me that the Wales Office 
is nothing more than a bolt-on to the Ministry of Justice and that the UK government, in the most unintelligent way, is again trying to draft the Welsh Constitution. So when will the day arrive when we can write our own constitution here in our own nation? Well, uh, I mean, Kirim well, I sympathise with what the member says. It's unfortunate that this bill won't be one that is comprehensive to settle Wales's constitution for decades. That's not what this bill does. There are some positive things in the bill. We want to see more positive things added to it. I've been discussing this with Lord Bourne, too, in the House of Lords, as a former member of this place, that he has a deep understanding of the matters that are vitally important here. But what, to me, what's important is that we have a bill that does move us forward. It doesn't move us far enough forward, considering the opinion of the majority of the members of this place, but there is work to do to ensure that the bill is something that we can consider and support ultimately. And so we look forward to, look to seeing what the response of the UK government is to some of the matters that haven't been solved yet. Uh, First Minister, as you say, uh, there has been progress made, and um, as aside from some of the constitutional issues that um, David Alstom has referred to, this bill will give power to the Assembly over such things as the name and electoral arrangements. So there is well, there progress has been made there. However, can I ask you, First Minister, tax devolution is part of and indeed running in tandem with the Wales Bill. What progress is being made in the development on the fiscal framework so important to ensure that Wales receives its fair share of funding when the block grant reduces to make way for Welsh tax revenues? Good progress is being made in discussions between the Cabinet Secretary and the uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, the settlement that will be acceptable to, uh, to all and is good for Wales. Uh, there are other areas, of course, which uh, remain uh, outstanding, uh, and uh, we hope to see a, a positive response from the UK Government in those areas. Nathan, Stefan Lewis. Apologies. Stefan Lewis. Uh, I think. Uh, the, the existing uh, constitutional arrangements cast doubts on the ability of the Assembly uh, to defend its areas of competence in the context of Brexit. But what assessment has the Welsh Government made of the current incarnation of the Wales Bill in terms of the Assembly's ability to uh, defend its areas of competence? And will the First Minister, in light of the current incarnation of the Wales Bill, give serious consideration to introducing a great continuity bill in this Assembly to affirm the Assembly's competence on matters that may be transferred from the European Union to, the, to Wales and the United Kingdom? I mean, two points. First of all, the Wales Bill itself uh, will not be a comprehensive solution to Wales' uh, constitution. We'll still have uh, anomalies where this Assembly will make the law uh, in terms of most public order, but the agencies that enforce public order law will not be answerable to the Assembly or the Government. It will be possible, under the current arrangements, for somebody to be arrested in this city for an offence that is not an offence in Wales, but is in England. It will be possible for somebody to serve a sentence uh, in England for an offence that is an offence in Wales, but not in England. Uh, these are the anomalies that, that are thrown up with, with the settlement. So there's much to do uh, in making that more coherent, although it will not be as coherent uh, as I would have hoped. Uh, the bill he makes mention of, really, we must see what's in the so-called Great Repeal Bill. Uh, if, if all it does, this is the way it's been presented, if all it does is simply enshrine existing EU law in all the jurisdictions uh, and countries of the UK, then I can understand the sense in that, uh, and we will uh, look at the situation uh, afresh to see whether there's any need to proceed along the lines that he suggested uh, once the detail of that bill becomes clear. But the principle will be, of course, uh, that no power should be lost to the uh, people of Wales, and that any powers that transfer from Brussels in devolved areas come straight here. They, they pass and go, but unfortunately do not collect money on the way. Question with Nathan. Question eight, Nathan Gill. Um, will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's policy on business rates? Well, we're committed to supporting small businesses through our Small Business Rates Relief Scheme and Transitional Relief. Thank you, First Minister. Um, small businesses tell me that they are hanging on by their fingernails. There are some winners as a result of the recent revaluation, but there are many, many more losers. I received an email last night at midnight from a small business owner outside of my constituency who, has been, who had seen that I was going to be asking this question today. She felt so strongly about it. She, um, she contacted me to say that her re-evaluation 
has resulted in a 48% increase in her rateable value. Now I know that many business owners and their employees are desperate for this government to consider introducing the same terms around small business rates relief that the UK government have, have and they've responded to the consultation that, that you guys have asked for, and that's what they've said. So the question really I've got for you is, are you going to listen to Well, I, I would argue that what we have in place is more generous now than is the case in England. Why? Because it reaches more businesses. 70% uh, of businesses will receive some form of support through the Business Rates Relief Scheme. Over half of eligible businesses will pay no, relief, uh, no rates at all. That is far in excess as a percentage of businesses than is the case uh, end of the system in, in England, though it would appear uh, on, on the surface to be more generous. But in fact, the reach of the Welsh Scheme is, uh, is deeper. That said, of course, we do recognise there may be some businesses who will lose out as a result of revaluation, as there always are whenever there is revaluation, which is why we have introduced or will be introducing the Transitional Rate Relief Scheme. Russell George. Um, First Minister, Labour candidates in the uh, Assembly elections this year met with small businesses across Paris during the election campaign and told them, vote Labour and get a tax cut. Uh, I do quote one candidate who said, business rates tend to form a higher proportion of the total operating costs for small businesses, and many Paris businesses are under se serious financial pressure, and so will breathe a sigh of relief if Labour is returned on May the 5th. Now, many of these businesses, or these businesses that were being referred to, are now facing a business rate hike. So what do you say to these businesses who were told by Labour candidates that they would get a tax cut in their business rates who will now be paying more in business rates? Well, they clearly are, because, as I say, 70% are having a tax cut as a result of a scheme which has been temporary but renewed every year for some years. Uh, uh, there is no permanence to the current scheme. We are introducing a permanent scheme uh, in next year uh, in order to make sure that, that we have a scheme that is durable because businesses cannot exist on a, on a system where uh, uh, the, the rates relief scheme is simply renewed every year without them knowing whether it will be or, or not. And we continue to make sure that the vast majority of Welsh businesses get the, uh, the relief that they need. Question now. Question 9, Lynn Neagle. Will the First Minister make a statement on the impact of the benefits cap in Torvine? Well, the estimate is that around 200 households in Torvine will be affected by the UK Government's lowering of the benefit cap in 2016 to 17, with an average loss of £60 per week uh, if they don't respond by moving into work or increasing their hours. Um, thank you, First Minister. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday's extension of the benefits cap will, I believe, ensure that more children are pushed into poverty by the Tories' welfare reforms. The figures that you have given are absolutely correct. £58 per week is a significant sum of money, uh, and there are some 516 children who are in households who are affected. A number of those families are already in rent arrears, and of course the fear now is that they will have to choose between uh, buying food for their families or paying their rent. Um, there's been a very strong partnership approach in Torvine led by the Council to mitigating the impact of welfare reform and much of that work has been done under the auspices of Communities First. Given the Welsh Government's current consultation on Communities First, what assurances can you offer that whatever emerges uh, from that consultation, this work will continue to be a priority for Welsh Government? Well, clearly, we want to keep the best practice that has been established over the, uh, the last few uh, years. And the uh, Cabinet Secretary has, of course, said that he's minded to phase out the Communities First programme, but also, of course, to develop a new approach to building resilient uh, communities. And of course, uh, which is why uh, the engagement process is so important for us to hear uh, examples that the member has uh, referred to in order to make sure that that best practice uh, continues in the future with the new arrangements. Mohammed Ashka. Presiding officer, does the First Minister agree that there has to be a maximum level of financial support that Clement can expect the state to provide and that people on benefits should not be able to receive more than the average working family earns in work in Wales? Well, I, I regret the fact that the uh, UK government has withdrawn uh, benefits of those in work. People in work, their circumstances would improve and their incomes would improve, and they have been hammered as a result of actions taken by the UK government. The bedroom tax is another example of that. I certainly deplore 
uh, the actions over the last few years where those who are the most vulnerable uh, have been the ones who have suffered uh, the most, while well, uh, those, of course, at the very top end of the income stream had a tax cut. Uh, if there was anything more regressive as a tax policy, then that was it. David Rowlands. Uh, uh, will the First Minister agree with me that there are many hard-working families in Torvine who would be delighted with a take-home pay of £400, which may well be the reason why 20%, 1% of the unemployed in Torvane have declared they do not want a job. Well, I don't know where that figure from. What I can say to him is that our unemployment rate is... Uh... First Minister is answering the question. First Minister. Our unemployment rate is 4.1%. We continue to, uh, to provide jobs for our uh, people. I, I, I regret the, the, the member's tone because um, I, I, I don't believe that's his true view. He, he, his view, I believe, is that there was a time in this country when there was a contract between people and the state, where the state would do what it could to provide housing, education, to provide good health if they became unemployed. That has been whittled away uh, over the years. Uh, and when he uh, tries to pit people who are unemployed against those who are employed, I think that is the wrong way forward. The reality is for many people, they struggle to get work because of sometimes disabilities. They struggle to get work, uh, which is why they need extra help and qualifications, which we are, which we are providing. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I, I don't agree that demonizing people who are on benefits is actually a good way of building cohesion in society. I thank the First Minister.